Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our attendees. Welcome to our um, CBI COCO webinar on the topics online tools and uh, resources. I hope you uh, enjoy uh, our webinar uh, today. Um, just one little note after the webinar, please take one minute to fill in our uh, survey to, uh, before you close the webinar because it helps us to make our webinars even better. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, as I said today, we will have um, a webinar on online tools and resources presented by uh, Gustavo Ferro. I think for many people uh, know him already. And for who doesn't know Gustavo um, yet, he will introduce himself when he will start um, his presentation. So, before we start the actual webinar, I would, I would like to give you a short uh, introduction. Uh, who am I? And, and um, what CBI can uh, do for you. So uh, my name is Jantin Ritten and I am part of the market intelligence team of the CBI and I am working uh, partly also for our development team. Next slide please, Gustavo. And um, so we and my previous work has been that I've been always active in green coffee trading and now uh, working with CBI for over more than a year, I'm happy to work now also in the cocoa sector. Next, please. Um, I shared today the agenda, so we have the opening and we have small, small introduction on CBI and then most of the time we'll be uh, presenting uh, our um, topics on, on cocoa, on online tools and resources by Gustavo and we will have at the end about 50 minutes for questions and answers. Um, Questions that cannot be answered within the time of our webinar will be um, sent to you after the webinar um, by email. So if you if any questions of you, um, there's not enough time, don't worry, we will answer them to you later. Next, please. So we have um, our mission of CBI is to connect uh, small to medium sized exporters in developing countries to the uh, European market and thereby we would like to contribute to the sustainable and inclusive econ economic uh, growth. And we do so by developing um, projects with SMEs in these countries. Next please. We have um, many uh, different CBI target countries, you see them here on the slides. Um, so they go from Asia to Latin America to Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um, we try to um, develop um, our projects in these countries within the 14 sectors that we are active. Next please, Gustavo. So we are active in 14 sectors. You see them here on the screen. And um, of course today um, we focus ourselves on uh, the sector cocoa. Next please. We work with um, different kind of target groups. So we work uh, with business support organizations. We work with importers uh, throughout uh, the European Un Union and uh, the United Kingdom. We work with policymakers, and uh, we work with uh, exporters on small to uh, medium-sized um, exporters throughout all these countries. Next, please. Our core um, competences are, are actually five type of services. So the um, company coaching, the training, the European Union market entry and enabling environmental uh, support is being executed within our projects that we run. And number five, the uh, European Union market intelligence reports we make. Um, is That's the reason why we are here today in this webinar. So certain topics that we have within our market intelligence will be uh, discussed today and explained to you today. Um, next, please. We have, um, as CBI, we have different kind of market information studies, which we provide through our website, which we publish there for free. And it's being divided into a part that's called market analyze. And within the market analysis, we have the demand in Europe and we have the trends in Europe, which can offer the opportunities for you. And we have the part of our studies, which is the market entry. And thereby we have the topics buyer requirements, tips for finding European buyers, and tips for doing business with European buyers, and tips how to organize your exports 
to Europe. And all these studies can be found on our website. And besides these two modules, we also make country fact sheets or uh, product fact sheets. But in the case of COCO, it's many times country fact sheets. And there we have um, certain cocoa, uh, cocoa subjects that we um, analyze within these studies. Next, please. This is um, our website, how it looks. So you enter into the CBI website and then you go to market information. There you can find all the different sectors that we are active in. And amongst them, you see the cocoa and cocoa products. If you click on that, um, you will go then into the Cocoa and Cocoa Products uh, website and you will find there our different kind of um, studies we make. You can all click them, you can share them, you can download them uh, or you can read them online. Um, and it's, it's quite a lot of information that we put there which can be very helpful for you as an uh, SME. Um, so please have a look. Then I would like to, uh, oh, here you see, sorry, one example, if you go into the study, you see, for example, here, which trends offer opportunities or both threats, and there you can see the study, and then you see where, how you can share it um, if you would like to do that. Uh, I would like now to give the floor uh, to Gustavo to start, um, I think, a very interesting webinar for you, so um, uh, I hope you enjoy it. And um, well, good luck, Gustavo. Thank you, Yanti. Uh, maybe just to confirm uh, with the support team, you guys can hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, just to start, maybe, uh, as Yanti said, maybe some of you already know me. I saw some familiar names in, in the audience list, and I, I, I've been in touch with some of you uh, through other means as well, not only through CBI. Uh, but some of you do not know me. I'm part of a team uh, for the uh, Cacao Research. Uh, we have a market intelligence team for that. Uh, I'm Gustavo Ferron, the lead researcher. I work with uh, Lisa Krothaus. She's a researcher with me. And with Maurice De Koning, who's our sector expert for Cacao. And we do this assignment for uh, Profound Advisors in Development. So uh, this is the uh, organization hiring us to do the work for CBI. So CBI hires us to do it. I'm independent uh, consultant. I used to work at Profound. Now I'm doing it independently, but I do have 13 years of experience in international trade and development projects. One of my favorite sectors and one of my, uh, one of the sectors I find most, most interesting is cacao, of course. I've been uh, talking about it. I've been writing about it since 2008 for CBI. And I also do, of course, the coffee studies, which is very interesting because I managed to compare a little bit to the developments and the profile and the buyers and everything between those two sectors. So this is quite an interesting uh, experience to have. Uh, and also I've been doing some work for other organizations as well. Uh, I'm working currently in some webinars for Peru, Colombia, uh, Central America, West Africa. I'm doing some projects in Peru and Colombia through CIPO, the Swiss Import Promotion Program, and also some uh, work in derivatives for Swiss Contact and USAID and grow liberia uh some some also uh, documents and some research on the premium cocoa market and other things in the past as well including the uh, research and the value chain analysis for connecting central america which is the cbi program as well and some other work with kati and Pro ecuador you guys have my linkedin here if you want to read more if you want to contact me <laughs> Uh, so Yantin already explained the CBI website. Uh, as Yantin said, this is where the information is centralized and we try to make it as practical and as simple as possible because we know that information has to be delivered like that. And uh, it's for free, so you guys can uh, explore and click on everything. And uh, for the ones that do not have English as your first language or if you prefer to read in another language actually, uh, you all, we can always use the translate function of the browser because actually these documents are now given as HTML. So you can translate it as you browse through the studies. So that's quite interesting uh, thing to keep in mind. Uh, and as you guys might have read, there were some publications we already uh, did in the beginning of the year when the whole COVID uh, pandemic started to hit uh, Europe and uh, all other countries that we work in, uh, we did write an article about it with the expected uh, impact of COVID 
on the cacao sector and chocolate. This I wrote with Lizanne, uh, my colleague, and uh, Jeroen Kruft also wrote about how to respond to this crisis and uh, what to do in order to maybe optimize the resources you have and uh, all these things. And there we centralize a lot of resources already, but not so much on the digital tools and resources because this is something that, uh, yeah, I'm presenting to you guys now. And I find it very useful just to keep in mind because as we see in the cacao market at the moment, we have an issue of course with uh, a decrease in demand. And how do we know that? Uh, we look at the usual uh, cacao grindings as an indicator of market demand. And what we have seen in the last two quarters that were reported by the European uh, Cocoa uh, Association is that uh, there was a decrease in relation to 2019. So that was quite quite clear, actually. You see, in the quarter, the first quarter of this year, uh, it was quite stable, and there was even a slight growth because I think some buyers were uh, stockpiling and you know guaranteeing resources. But uh, as as the year progressed, we saw. In the second quarter, for example, a 9% uh, decrease, and in the third quarter, a 5% uh, decrease in comparison with 2019. So that's actually quite significant. And uh, you guys can follow these statistics because uh, these are all published in per quarter. So the next quarter uh, figures are going to be, to be published in January 2021. And this is interesting to, to follow, not only because it indicates uh, where the market is going in terms of demand, but also the effect on prices. And uh, as you guys know, there was a decrease in prices, I think around July, August. Now it's a bit more stable, but it's good to check every day and every moment that you're, uh, you're actually working with buyers and with the market just to give it a check. And I put the link to you guys uh, also here so that you can check. Uh, and of course, when you're talking about statistics, statistics for cacao, if you're talking about cacao grinders, et cetera, of course, a big part of the production is coming from Ivory Coast and Ghana. So a lot of these issues that we discussed also depend on the production of these two countries, on the developments in general regarding those two countries. So you might ask me, how do I know what is happening with the specialty market? Because this is something that uh, a lot of you guys that are in the audience and uh, a lot of your cacao and a lot of the, the exporters and producers that CBI is working with is uh in the specialty segment so it, it was indeed the one segment of the market that had the most serious and the most impactful effects of the pandemic because what happened is that a lot of the lockdowns were targeting specifically the access channels for the specialty chocolates and the in the premium products that use specialty cacao so restaurants hotels the specialized chocolate chocolate shops premium retailers and of course, the whole chain, chocolate makers, uh, all the tree to bar makers, etc. They uh, actually suffered quite a quite a big impact. And there was a survey from the Fine Cacao and Chocolate Institutes, which was uh, released in April 2020. Now this year, uh, the survey was conducted with uh, 125 companies, usually uh, SMEs, um, and the survey was basically separated into three parts: uh, one for producers, exporters; the other one for chocolate companies; and the other one for pastry chefs. And uh, it showed that not only that 91% of these companies responded, there was a decrease in demand, which was very clear at the time, but also that 20% of, uh, of the people that um, responded to the survey said that there was a critical threat to their very existence. This is quite serious to think that 20% of the respondents said that. And uh, at the same time, we, uh, being that these are companies that are resourceful when they're used to operating with uh, improvised ways. 59% uh, of these companies actually voiced that they migrated to digital marketing as well. And I really had the, the opportunity and the chance to speak with uh, Dr. Carla Martin from FCCI uh, just before this webinar and uh, the survey for uh, the producer and exporter is still open. You guys can still contribute because the survey will pro probably be published uh, uh, around January in 20, it should say 2021 here, not 2020, sorry, it's a mistake here. Uh, and uh, there's still a chance that you guys participate, but from the market side, it's apparent that there is a bit more optimism. The critical threat to existence has diminished, so uh, there is more optimism in the sector. And I think this is also related to the fact that people did migrate to digital marketing and found the different ways to relate to their consumers as well. 
So it is quite clear that at the same time we face crisis, people also adapt and consumers adapt and companies adapt as well. So it's good to know. And uh, as I said, you guys can still participate as exporters and producers. The, the link is right here. And uh, I encourage you guys to give the data because uh, everyone in the sector is using it to redirect better our uh, interventions and the things that we can do to help you guys out as well. In my side, from my side, in terms of information, uh, and as we know, like all the events and trade fairs and festivals, they are currently not going on uh, in the world, and they are all digital, and there are a lot of travel restrictions. And this has sort of led us to be more proactive. So how can we uh, supplement this idea of contacting people and still be in touch with your network? And I think this makes the relevance of the online tools and resources even stronger. And this is why I'm focusing on that in this webinar. Uh, of course, we do have some uh, tips in our two modules, finding buyers and doing business. Uh, but I, today I would like to focus on alternative tools as well. Uh, and I want to focus around uh, the subjects of market linkages. So how to use trade fairs and sector associations online to optimize market linkages that you guys might have. Uh, quality, so both management uh, and assessment, so quality management, quality assessment in Cacao, to give you guys some online resources for that as well, as well as sustainability. As you know, sustainability is a huge issue and has become even a bigger issue now in the pandemic because people are tending towards more uh, conscious sort of consumption, hopefully. <laughs> And uh, there is more attention to sustainability, uh, not only now, but it's a long-term trend. So it's important to talk about it and to exchange on that. And I ask you guys to uh, use the question tool as well uh, on, the, on this uh, GoToWebinar uh, control panel. If you guys want to share some tools that you use personally, because what I can do is that when I uh, distribute the presentation to you guys, I can put all the resources that you share, I can put in one slide so that I can also redistribute in the community. I think this can be a nice thing to do as well. So you guys get this presentation as a, as a PDF together with uh, all the resources that you guys share as well. Anyway, so let's just first start with the idea of market linkages. And I think what is important here is just to understand that even though trade fairs are canceled, they still have resources that you can use to uh, capitalize on your uh, database and to discover new things. Uh, and of course, all, this website, all the websites of trade fairs, they do have exhibitor lists and they're still online. So you guys can explore, even if you're not going to the trade fairs and even if you think that yeah, it would be very costly to maybe participate in the online versions, etc. you can use these exhibitor uh, lists in order to see who is there, uh, who's exhibiting, what products are there. And uh, in fact, Chocoa, uh, the trade fair here in Amsterdam is going online. So it's a good opportunity to actually participate in a virtual trade fair and to optimize the tools which are given in that uh, opportunity. So this is an example of a trade fair that was a physical trade fair, but they're going online. And in fact, they are uh, preparing right now. So I don't know the exact tools they are going to offer, but for sure matchmaking a lot of with the conferences. So this is quite interesting to uh, keep in mind. I put the website here, but of course, when you're thinking about trade fairs, you usually think uh, cacao and chocolate trade fairs because we are in the cacao sector and we are only thinking about that. Well, there are also other trade fairs and events to explore now virtually. Uh, I'm not telling you guys to eventually maybe go there physically, but all these trade fairs, they do offer resources that you can explore online as well. So what I recommend to you guys, uh, I know there's some people in the audience working with, the, with derivatives, there's some people working with chocolate, and I think most of you guys are working with cacao beans. Uh, but I would ask you guys, when you're looking at the trade fairs and other events that are somehow linked with cacao, chocolate, or food, that you analyze what is your offer and what is your target segment? Is it suitable for you? For example, uh, you do have a, a trade fair in Germany that is actually going to take place online this year, which is the Biofach. And Biofach is a trade fair for organic only. And if you do have organic cocoa beans and if you do have derivatives or chocolate, it is an interesting tra trade fair to explore in terms of the resources that you can have online as well. So looking at the list of exhibitors, looking at the importers and manufacturers that are attending the trade fair, uh, the organic food industry, how is it growing for uh, uh, cocoa derivatives or how is it growing for chocolate? 
Uh, and what you're going to find in Biofac as well is a, a big side on the health product uh, segment. And there is a part on the, on the Biofac exhibition that is called Vivaness, which also has the natural cosmetics, which is very relevant for the cocoa butter. So uh, this is an example. The other one is Ciel in France. Uh, the trade fair was canceled this year, but they still have the list of exhibitors online. So you guys can do the same thing. Uh, just look at your offer and look at the target segments of this kind of trade fairs and see how it compares. Because I think what is important during the, this pandemic and during this uh, period that we cannot meet with a lot of people, et cetera, is to work on your uh, database as well, to work on your uh, 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 customer databases and your uh, different segments that you can target. And of course, there are many other examples like the ISM in Germany for confectionery is another trade fair that can offer you interesting tools. Uh, some of these trade fairs do not have the exhibitors list right now because they were either canceled or they are postponed, but it's important that you guys uh, access their websites to um, get this list when they are available because they're very interesting and very complete. I'm just gonna show you two examples. Uh, this one is for Biofac. Right now they are uh, working on the, on the list for the 2021 trade fair. Uh, and this is because uh, they are going online. And it, so this, this uh, exhibitor list that I'm showing here is currently offline, but I, I'll ask you guys to check maybe in January it's online again with the list of exhibitors for the, for the current uh, uh, exhibition for the 2021 version. But what I ask you guys to do is also to try different terms. So for example, in this uh, list of 2020, you can try, for example, uh, there were uh, 248 chocolate exhibitors, if you use the term chocolate, uh, and, and only 32 for cacao and 66 for cocoa. So when you're using these websites, what you can do is to also try different things, just to try different terminology. And also uh, in these big trade fairs, what is important is that you use the filter version of uh, these tools. When, this is important because uh, maybe you have a target market or a specific target uh, industry that you want to uh, use. So this, this kind of filters can help you out as well. And these are big trade fairs. So you're going to find so many companies and so many options that you might as well filter a little bit out according to your interest. Uh, another example, which is currently online still, is the Cial trade fair, which I mentioned before. As I said, sometimes you use different terminology and it can completely change your results. And what I tried here was uh, Coco. I had uh, 453 exhibitors. I only had three with cacao, one with cacao with a K, just because I wanted to try, uh, and 520 with chocolate. So filter out, explore these tools and work on your databases, your bio databases, and filter out, just look at your segment segmentation, look at your possibilities and make it your own tool. Um, you can also use the sector association websites and different organizations in, in different segments. As I mentioned before, uh, you do have associations and uh, markets which are more directed at bulk cacao and some of them are more specialized in certified, some of them are more specialized in uh, specialty. So you also need to look at your own offer and then compare that with what these associations are uh, displaying. And when I look at uh, sector associations, what I look at is the industry representation and the level of the value chain. For example, you do have associations that are representing traders or processors, importers, and sometimes chocolate makers, like really specialty chocolate makers, been to bar chocolate makers. Uh, what is the target market? So is it an association that is representing uh, companies at an international level, at a regional level, like uh, EU level? or national level, for example, Switzerland, Netherlands, et cetera, and the segmentation profile of the members. Are these members that are more on the ethical side of the story, niche side, like uh, certified uh, or specialty cacao, or mainstream? So this is important that you ask yourselves. And what I'm gonna show you guys here is just one, two, three, four examples of the Federation of Coco Commerce, uh, Euro Coco, uh, Choco, Cho, from Belgium, sorry, that's difficult to pronounce, and the FCCI, which is not, a, an, it's, a, it's an organization, of course. Uh, it's a, an institute, in fact, representing uh, the fine cacao and chocolate uh, sector. So I'll show you some examples from different 
segments so you guys can get a good example of how to use it. And so starting with uh, FCC, the Federation of Cocoa Commerce, what is interesting here is that you really see the mandate and you can relate the mandate that we have with what kind of industries they are representing. So you can see it's very broad because it's representing quite a few uh, industry stakeholders involved in uh, contracts, involved in, involved in trade. So what is interesting is first to check the mission and to check what they do and who they represent. So you can get that from the website as well. Uh, and then you can see that nearly all actors involved in, uh, in cacao bean trade uh, mainly are in the list of members. So usually in these associations, you have a members page and you can go directly there and you have a whole database of companies. So that's quite, quite nice to see. In some cases, as in, in the case of the FCC, you're going to have some buyers uh, involved in derivatives as well. And in the, this one too, you can actually filter per country or activity, which is very nice because then you can also filter out according to your own interest. Uh, another example is the sector association, uh, Eurococo. And uh, they also do have a, a member page that you can check the big companies that are involved in uh, cacao in Europe. So this is quite a powerful tool because you can see who the main players are. And this is uh, showing you also who is influencing the sector, who is interesting to talk to. And these are all the main actors of the European industry in terms of trade, warehousing, grinding, processing, etc. And you can relate that with the fact that, of course, the, the grinding statistics is coming from Eurococo. So that's very interesting to see who's there. And uh, I don't know if you guys noticed before when I showed you the grinding statistics, what is interesting is that the, let's say the information is in the details because when you go to the statistics, you can actually see the companies that are uh, providing this information, which basically means it's another database that you can use. And this is very nice because it really shows that when you're exploring these websites, you can have some details that are really helpful as well. And here you have, yeah, uh, basically 21 companies reporting, uh, gr grinding, uh, uh, their grinding statistics to, uh, to their Eurococo. And what is nice uh, is that you can really see the majority of the industry for uh, cacao processing who's representing this industry. So this is also quite powerful. And it's really showing the point that when you know the purpose of the organization, you can really understand uh, who these members are. And the same thing for uh, a national association, like the National Association for Chocolate in Belgium. Uh, that you can enter the website and basically this kind of associations, as I mentioned before, they do have a members page. So uh, you can see here the organization is basically representing 170 members. So that's quite sizable. And this is going from craft chocolate makers to multinationals. So it's a whole range of companies involved for one specific market, one specific national market the whole range of products coming from chocolate. This is amazing database to have, and it's available. I mean, I know some of you guys sometimes uh, sometimes ask, ah, where can we pay for a database of bias, et cetera? This is all out there. It's just a matter of organizing it and making it your own uh, database according to your interest. Uh, and going back to, the, to this association, what is nice is also that you can browse according to the different segments. So according to your product, you can also relate that back to the different segments that the organization organizes the companies around. So for example, you have the bulk chocolate, you have the, uh, the spreads, the candy bar, chocolate sweets, etc. So you can really uh, navigate this kind of association, keeping in mind, not everyone is for you, not everyone is a match for you, but the ones that are, you can actually find them here. <laughs> Uh, another very powerful tool and that I really like using is the uh, FCCI Fine Cacao and Chocolate Map. Uh, this centralizes a lot of the industry players that are working with fine cacao and chocolate. Uh, so that includes the main uh, traders that deal with specialty cacao, but also the main bean to bar makers in different parts of the world. And this is and also chocolate shops. So you can actually look at the end market as well. This is very powerful because um, 
these companies, they're not always represented by these bigger sector associations. And uh, by having this kind of resource and this kind of map, you can actually understand some markets that before you wouldn't have a good idea as to who is involved there because they do not have uh, representation at a higher level. So this is very interesting to have. And it's a powerful resource to ask yourselves what is going on, what, which ones are the most dynamic zones and regions of the market? Uh, how can I sell it? And by doing that, you guys can also work uh, in reverse. So if you see an interesting company or a company that you find it interesting for your product, you can always try to trace it back, how their value chain works, who's buying it, who's distributing, and how can I get to this company? Um, also, the websites of companies can be very interesting for you to uh, filter in or out. So for example, when you check in the website of a specific company, like a Bintu Bar Maker or even a bigger company, uh, it's important to understand what they do. Uh, are they importing or are they just manufacturing or doing uh, some chocolate making? Uh, this sometimes you can get even from uh, their website. So it's important that you understand if they're bi directly or not, in what kind of quantities are they a big company? Are they uh, represented in different origins, for example? Uh, where do they buy from? Uh, where are their origins? Sometimes maybe a specific chocolate maker is interested in African only origins, for example, or Latin American only origins, or they have a whole range of origins. So it's important to understand that. And also their segment, which market are they targeting? Because this will also tell you something about if your product is suitable to them. And uh, their certification requirements. Are these companies that specialize in organic fair trade uh, or uh, are they more specialized even in the specialty segment so they do not need certification? And these are questions that you should ask when you're uh, visiting those websites because this will be very important for you to not waste too much time in finding suitable matches for you. And another, in my opinion, very powerful tool that you can have through these companies by checking websites, etc., is that you can look at their uh, annual reports. So this one reports, uh, they can tell you their strategic direction of the companies, their sustainability objectives and projects, and the financial status, their investments, etc. This is interesting to see because then you can see what kind of partner they can be uh, on the market. Uh, and also what is interesting is you check which trade fairs do they attend and how do they present their products, both uh, in trade fairs but also in an uh, online shop, for example and how they communicate the message from a producer, from a producing community to uh, the consumer, because you can kind of relay it back to how you sell your product to them uh, so that you can see what their priorities are and their main principles and ideas. Uh, so I would advise you to indeed use this kind of uh, tools. I was just checking the time to see if I'm not too <laughs> extended. Uh, and uh, so this was about uh, creating linkages and using online tools to optimize this moment to look for new horizons for your market linkages. So this was about that. If you guys have any questions on it, of course, we're going to discuss it. Now I'd like to very quickly discuss quality management and diminishing risks. As you know, this is a very crucial time in trade in general, and it's important to keep quality it is important to also uh, do some extra things in order to safeguard that the quality is maintained in your product. A very good guide for that is actually the uh, Calbisco, the Irococo, and the FCC. It's a reference document as to how to handle uh, quality management in cacao from, yeah, from the very harvest to post-harvest and handling and transportation. And this is an interesting guide because it actually relates back to how the industry sees it, how the European industry treats quality. So this is very important that you guys actually use these resources that uh, are available. And they, this actually, this guide is available in English and Spanish and in French, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. And also consider the things that you're doing with your cacao, of course, the centralized post-harvesting, the homogenized homogenization of processes uh, in order for you to also uh, reach product consistency uh, at a larger volume maybe at the moment and uh, to tailor your post-harvest protocols as well in direct dialogue with your clients. This is important that you consult with your clients and adapt your offer as such. And uh, currently, of course, one of the big issues is that you might have to store 
the cacao for a longer time, so working on moisture contents and any other quality issues during the pandemic. Uh, I would also recommend you guys in this moment to check the, the international standards for the assessment of uh, uh, cocoa quality and flavor. This was developed with uh, industry players, uh, both private organizations, associations, and it's interesting because it lets you guys uh, develop your own operating standard operating procedures, meaning you can use these guides, which are also available for free and in English, Spanish and French. Uh, these are published uh, 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 for the industry to uh, homogenize the terminology and to speak about the same thing about quality. Uh, there is a working group uh, working on that and uh, there is more information on the website that I'm giving you guys that but it's also about creating a, a culture of quality and continuing improvement in your companies and organizations because uh, this, these documents are international reference and they are actually validated with a lot of companies, with a lot of industry players that you can use in order to understand how to assess quality and also how to speak about quality in a more uh, standardized way and to communicate with your buyers as such as well. And I think it's important that uh, to use this time of the pandemic uh, to reassess indeed your processes, internal processes, and this can be a powerful tool to do so. And uh, as, as, I'm, I'm, as I'm saying, all these resources are available for free and they're there to be used and uh, they're there to be understood as well and incorporated in your company operations. Uh, I would also like to speak about, of course, sustainability is an important issue at the moment. Uh, not at the moment, sorry, actually always. And at the moment, even more so because consumers are asking about it. And uh, there is a trend on the market, not only for chocolate, for cacao, but in food, in beverages and all products you can imagine that sustainability is the word of the day and it's the word of the century perhaps. And it's important that you understand how sustainability is organized and how people talk about it, how buyers talk about it. So basically, uh, sustainability here, I'm just trying to explain in three different levels. The governments, uh, for cacao specifically, they do have sustainability targets and platforms where they have alliances with private, uh, uh, private sector actors in order to standardize their understanding of sustainability and their interventions as well. In Switzerland, you have that. In Germany, you have that. In Netherlands, in Belgium, maybe I'm missing some of them, but a lot of countries that have big industries for cacao and chocolate, they do have uh, platforms to discuss sustainability. And uh, this is also reflected into the retailers' operations as well. Retailers are pretty adaptive to consumer demand, and they are actually working a lot with consumer demand. So you see in different retailers here in the Netherlands and in Switzerland, in the UK, in Germany, they do have agreements and they do have a specific targets regarding sustainability for their chocolate products. So uh, some uh, retailers, they do have minimum requirements for certification, for example. Uh, some others, they do have programs uh, which target sustainability in the cacao chain. As you know, the cacao chain is very contentious related to a lot of subjects. And the big companies, they also have uh, created different projects to address these issues and I have checked the websites of different uh, programs from the different big uh, cacao and chocolate companies. And a lot of it revolves around renovation, rehabilitation of crops, technical assistance, uh, gender issues are super important there. Child labor, uh, not even, yeah, it's, it's something that is, it has been important for a while now and it's become even more important. Reforestation, climate change, I don't even have to mention it because it is something that is growing in importance and there is more attention to it. And of course, they sometimes use certification as a tool as well as part of these programs. So it's important that you guys start checking a little bit what these companies are requiring from you. And I have some tools to present to you guys on that because I have noticed and it's, it's a common uh, knowledge thing that a lot of these companies, they use the UN uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, these goals, they revolve around 17, uh, let's say impact areas or uh, goal areas. And they are translated by the UN Global Compact in terms of business principles. So you have the different principles which are organized dif different area, uh, around different areas like human rights, labor standards, environment. Is my sound okay?
Yes, it is. Yes, Your it is. Your sound is okay. okay. Okay, I just had a notification here, but I'll just continue then. Uh, so the sprints was organized into these different areas, uh, which includes indeed envir uh, environment, anti-corruption, etc. But what is interesting here, and is interesting that you guys use, is uh, uh, making it your own. So what I wrote here, taking, taking sustainability into your own hands. Uh, what I do get in terms of sustainability, the kind of questions that I get is how can we create a sustainability policy or a code of conduct? Well. There are specific tools online for you guys to do that. So I put some of them here where you can kind of translate the sustainable development goals into specific actions. So for example, an action related to human rights or an action related to anti-corruption. There are specific um, activities that you can develop internally in your own companies, in your own exporting companies, et cetera, that will relate back to the UN guiding principles and in turn, these are related to impact. So for example, I want, to, uh, I want to diminish poverty, for example, what are the activities that I can do in my own company to not only do that, but also report back. So these are some of the tools that I put here, the SDG Compass, which is an inventory of the business indicators that you can use. Uh, you can basically filter by, uh, by sustainable development goal, and you can also filter by the business theme. So for example, not everything will be relevant for Cacao or for your company, but you can actually work through these different sustainable development goals and see which activities you can implement in order to uh, be an active business in those impact areas. So uh, I just put the tools here as well. And uh, I made it very short so that we can have a, a Q and A session. And I hope it was not too fast or that these tools are uh, also useful and new to you. This is important that uh, you saw some new things here. And I think we can go to the Q and A now or to the discussion. Yeah, first of all, um, thank you very much, Gustavo, for sharing all this value uh, information um, for our uh, attendees. Um, I do maybe would like to repeat um, what you have asked in the beginning of your presentation is within our question uh, option uh, in the go to webinar that you can put your online tools and resources that you use yourself already that have not been mentioned by Gustavo in the presentation to share because it would be nice if we can all together share our information and we will send that then out together with our presentation. So please feel free to share um, that information. Um, we don't have a lot of questions, so either means you have explained very well uh, I hope so. the the uh, the online to tools and the resources. Um, maybe we can point out a little bit on the sustainable uh, development goals that you don't need to um, immediately add all the sustainable development goals to your company, but start with a few or maybe one to pick out which is important for your company and that you from there on you can maybe uh, develop more. I, uh, I think what is nice and thing, uh, I don't know, wait, did I cut you off? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, is that they also look at the main subjects within Cacao and the subjects that are important to buyers. And that's why I was saying just check the websites of buyers and see what kind of subjects they address in their own sustainability programs. What do they prioritize that you can actually relay it back and that you can reflect that into your own business structure as well, that you're addressing risks. Exactly. I think that's a very important um, part of uh, implementing it into uh, your company. And then I find this question actually quite interesting. Maybe it, we cannot immediately answer this question, but it was addressed um, if there would be any resources or online tools for the logistic parts for, for small exporters to, uh, to the European Union, because sometimes it's, it can indeed be difficult for them to export um, to, to the EU. Uh, if there would be any resources, for the logistics parts of the um, of the of the cocoa yeah I'll, i'm gonna take a look at it probably itc 
has uh, something on that. I'm going to check and then I'll answer this question uh, in the follow-up as well. We do get the questions, we centralize them and then we ask them. I think I can see probably has some resources for logistics, International Trade Center. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, I can check uh, also with the uh, European Cocoa Association if there is something there. Um, I'll check, I'll, I'll respond directly. Yeah, and maybe associations that are within the producing countries which are active or on government uh, level, they might have also these kind of resources to um, to, to, to share with the exporters how they can use the logistics uh, part or how it works within these countries. We have another uh, question coming in. Um, it's, it is uh, considering that a um, commercial relationship in COVID takes a long time, perhaps up to two years to achieve a sale. That is common indeed that, that it's more for a long-term uh, relationships and a long-term uh, to make contracts, uh, it, it's, it's often in the long term. Um, it is important to strengthen the existing commercial relationships. And sorry, the screen is just hopping away from my, for me. Um, existing commercial relationship and to investigate the market with a view to the medium term. Um, somebody is addressing this question to you, uh, Gustavo. But I, I, uh, I think we can agree. Or... Go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I didn't know if it was a question or just a comment, just yeah. a, a comment share to the audience because of course, uh, yeah, I agree. And I think it's especially important moment because what we did see, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, when we were discussing this back in May, I think May or June, that a lot of companies and specifically in specialty cacao, they were sort of reassessing their supply chains to see what was working, what was not. And even though it was difficult to start relationships at the time, it was a good moment to prove that you're actually a good supplier, that you are able to keep your uh, supplies consistent uh, in terms of volume, value, at, uh, uh, sorry, volume, quality, and all the things that uh, suppliers should do. Because not only, even though it was a difficult moment to start relationships, it was also um, a moment where buyers were sort of looking at alternative, maybe supply sources for the long term. Um, so this proves the point in the, the statement just made. Yeah. Um, another question we have, is there a potential to work with matchmaking platforms for private or white label manufacturers in the developing countries? Oh, this is a very difficult question because it is a market that for now is very small, uh, especially let's say to produce a chocolate in the country and then uh, re-export it. I think that's what the question means, right? Private manufacturing, private label manufacturing. Uh, there are different business models for that. Of course, chocolate is uh, challenging in that respect, but I do see it as a future to start offering this, uh, but when the buyers are already quite confident that that's how they, they want to work. Because as you know, there are many private label manufacturers here in Europe, so you would be competing with uh, a lot of them. Yeah. And what is the expectation for the cocoa market? So for next year, 2021, um, will it grow, will it stabilize, or will it be more or less the same as 2020? We of course have uh, difficult times and, and strange times, so it might be, uh, it, it is I think very difficult to predict, as we do not know how countries will continue for the next coming months. Because if we only look at the Netherlands today, um, we've, we will uh, most likely enter into a very heavy lockdown for the next coming four weeks. And some other countries might also face, again, heavy lockdown. So it, it, I think it will be quite difficult to, to do um, yeah, prediction for the coming year. Yeah, what I'm worried about is the fact that you saw a decrease in sales during Easter, which is the a big time for sales of chocolate here. You know, I think France saw a decrease, Belgium saw a decrease, Italy, and uh, Christmas is the second one. Uh, Christmas is another time when there is a high consumption of chocolate, like a seasonal uh, uh, peak in consumption. And with this lock, with the lockdowns now. I think we could be concerned about liquidity and getting the market going again, because uh, I think there was quite a lot of optimism 
that uh, lockdowns were a little bit, uh, you know, uh, more lax uh, during the summer. Uh, and now we're back to lockdowns, but hopefully uh, companies found, a, found alternatives to market their chocolates and market their chocolate products that we will not be seeing too much of a decrease. Therefore, they would have liquidity to, to carry on and the economy would keep on going. We do see, I think it's important to check also the figures for January for the cocoa grindings, just to see how the market is developing in a higher level, just to get this feeling. And as I said, the FCCI uh, report coming out uh, regarding the effect for uh, the specialty sector uh, specifically. Okay. And we do have a remark on um, on costs on um, letter of credits or the different kind of uh, payment um, method that, yeah. that you could uh, handle within the um, cocoa sector. Um, I do think that we, in our studies, um, explain well that that there the possibility to pay is indeed via letter of credit but also as mentioned here in the remark that we also explain the possibility for example cash against documents through bank collection so i think um if you go to our website and go to our modules the market entry part and there you have our four different studies um, you find um, additional information on the different kind of of shipping methods with the, with the payment methods and also which are most common in this case within the cocoa uh, sector yeah maybe the question is related to whether this is changing due to the crisis maybe that of course it would be safer to get a payment uh, through a, a letter of credit maybe or something like that from the supplier side but uh, what needs to be understood also is that there's liquidity problems everywhere. Uh, it's also from yeah. the market side. So uh, everyone is facing this problem. So I, I don't think we could expect uh, major changes on that as far as I know, uh, as, in, yeah, as far as my knowledge goes on how this is going uh, in the B2B uh, yeah. relationships. And um, is it known what the market share could be for cocoa nibs? As this no, is that's a, very is, difficult. Just, yeah. uh, if, if they are if they are writing from Peru or from Ecuador, the statistics are available through their export promotion agencies. Uh, I have so, the, per country, it, that is available from the Latin American side. You mean from their exports? From the exports, okay. So they could calculate it back to the actual figure if they get this percentage if it's from peru or ecuador this figure is available because i i think ecuador reports on it peru for sure okay it's a question uh, from latin america so it does not mention the country but i think yeah. it's clear for the attendancy now for which countries it's available and for which it's not available yeah uh, we do also yeah. have a question on packaging but i'm not too sure if we are um, at the moment um, with this webinar able to answer these kind of questions. So I would like to answer um, that after the webinar so we can uh, get a good answer to um, to this question uh, concerning packages because it's, it's quite a different um, subject within our webinar at this moment. So um, for the one for um, the attendee who asked this question, we will we will come back to you uh, on this um, on this subject. Gustav, on the biofag, that is uh, going to be uh, quite soon in uh, 2021. Maybe we can repeat when this will take place because it's 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 quite a big one and it might be very good for the attendees to at least um, yeah. maybe have a look in time. Uh, uh, also, the Ethereum thing because uh, it's going to cost 10 euro for you to visit. The ticket you have to register. Okay, that's, it's very good that you mentioned it that um, yeah. you have an, uh, a registration fee then for 10 euros. Mm -hmm. uh, if if people are uh, in the possibility to um, to register and uh, to do this, it might be very helpful to see how uh, these um fares are um acting online because it's most likely going to be the future for 2021 as well and the information you can find there and maybe the possibility to connect to buyers can be of very high value uh, for your business yeah i'm just checking the dates for biofac one second i'm just 
But so everything, everything is online and they're trying to recreate the real life experiences also. So there is the, there's going to be the exhibitors list and like a sort of a matchmaking platform. So it's between the 17th and the 19th of February. Uh, and indeed, like you can register either as an exhibitor with the different packages. So you have the basic package, the premium package, et cetera, et cetera, or the uh, visitor uh, just a ticket, e-ticket. And this, of course, is a unique opportunity because usually to attend BioFAC, you would have to travel to Nuremberg and usually the, the tickets are quite expensive to travel there because of small airports, uh, fewer flights, whatever. And uh, this is actually a nice opportunity to see how it works, as Jantin said. And Chocoa is also online. Yeah, I think it's very valuable if you uh, have, a, uh, have the possibility uh, to attend. Indeed, normally you would have very high cost of traveling there and um, accommodation is also quite expensive uh, around these kinds of fairs because they are so big. Um, but I've, they are very valuable uh, to see um, how you could connect to uh, buyers or maybe your existing buyers and to keep um, in contact with your relation uh, and, and build up your relationship for the long term. Yeah, and a lot of ingredient importers and people that are usually, they they sometimes are not in the chocolate or the cacao trade fairs, but they are in these trade fairs because sometimes they do have a wider range of products. For example, they work with other ingredients, uh, like even coffee or something like that. And if they're organic certified, they're usually there in this kind of trade fairs. Very good. I think we, um... The questions that we still have open up, we will answer after the uh, webinar. I think we should um, round up um, to keep um, in time of our webinar. So first of all, I would like to thank you very much, Gustavo, for having this presentation and sharing all these valuable information for uh, our attendees. Uh, I very much hope um, it was very useful for them, but I have no doubt, I think it um, I'm almost sure that it was very useful to them. Um, we shall share the presentation with all of you together with the recorded session, so you can, um, uh, in your own time, have a look, a good look at all the um, online tools and resources that uh, Gustavo is sharing with you. Um, I think um, we are um, at the end of the year. I would like to wish everybody um, good holidays within the next um, one to two weeks in uh, these difficult times um, stay safe stay healthy uh, merry christmas to everyone and we will be back in um, 2021 with new webinars we will announce them in time to you and we will have different uh, subject then uh, with but all within our uh, market intelligence uh, market studies and please look uh, at our website to find all the information which can be very relevant to your uh, business so again, thank you very much, uh, Gustavo, for sharing all this with us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for attending from all sides of uh, all possible sides of the world. Uh, and as I think they should, uh, they need one minute, right, for the evaluation as well. Yeah, please. If you, if we end the webinar, please take your time to fill out the survey. It's a very, very short one, but it helps us to improve for our next webinar uh, that we would like to give to you. And while well, we hope you will keep on um, attending our webinars, um, because it, it, yeah, it's a, of great value to us that we have so many attendees um, attending our webinars. So thank you very much again. Thank you.